In Japan, the way that in information is distributed is different. Uh, an example of this is, of course, the Kisha Club right. system. And it's basically like um, a kind of like information cartel system. They only admit members of the established major Japanese media. It's easy to be uh, uh, shut out for people using, you know, these relatively new technologies, you know, ignoring the corporate power structures that existed in the past and going on their own and doing a great job. Okay, you know, you've done, uh, you said you work a writer and you also did some journalistic work before you came to Japan. So I'd like to ask you, what's the, any differences you might have noticed or challenges you might have noticed being a writer and or journalist here in Japan compared to being a writer and or journalist outside Japan? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, in Japan, uh, the way that in information is distributed is different. And uh, an example of this is, of course, the Kisha Club right. system. Now, as a freelancer, uh, that's not really something that I have to deal with. Um, but if you've never heard of the Kisha Club system, it's basically like um, a kind of like information cartel system in mm -hmm. which news is controlled uh, by the establishment. So Kisha Clubs, which uh, mean journalist clubs or press clubs, are these little institutions that are embedded in uh, Japanese um, governments and uh, other organizations. And if you look on, for example, the Wikipedia page for Kisha Club, there's you know, more than a dozen listed for everything from the Imperial Household Agency has a Kisha Club, the Tokyo Metropolitan Police Department has a Kisha Club, um, you know, the Liberal Democratic Party has a Kisha Club, uh, et cetera, et cetera, it goes on and on. So the, the problem with the criticism that Kisha Clubs have faced is that they're exclusive. They only admit members of the established major Japanese media. Uh, they uh, traditionally have been closed to say freelancers or you know, smaller magazines, smaller newspapers, and also um, foreign journalists. Now, foreign journalists have made inroads over the years like Reuters and Bloomberg, uh, for example, managed to get into the uh, Tokyo Stock Exchange Kisha Club, mm. I believe, some quite a while ago now. Um, mm. But if you're, you know, an independent uh, person trying to cover news here, it can be pretty difficult if you're not part of uh, a Kisha Club. Um, for example, uh, some years ago, I was working for IDG News, which is a, an American uh, technology news group. Right. And I was writing some story about, um, it was a, I believe it was a cyber criminal uh, who committed some fraud or something like that. And uh, he had been arrested. And I want to confirm, I wanted to confirm reports that this person had been arrested by police in, I think it was Kawasaki. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so what did I do? I called up the police in Kawasaki and uh, I said, yeah, I'm a representing an American media outlet. I'd just like to confirm this happened. You arrested the suspect and the person on the other end of the phone just could not process. It was like I walked out of a UFO. <laughs> like, who is this person calling us up out of the blue, asking whether we've done something like arrest someone like this is not part of the Keisha Club system. And, and uh, basically, I... After delays and delays, I got a begrudging uh, yes, an arrest was made. That's all we're going to tell you. So if you're not part of the system like that, it's easy to be uh, uh, shut out. Uh, and um, the Keisha Club system is very controversial. But, um, you know, the benefit for the government and other entities is that they can control the flow of information. Um, meanwhile, uh, journalists in the Keisha Club itself will... Um, self-police or self-censor them uh, their own activities sometimes because right. they have this kind of horse trading system where they write on a blackboard like who's going to do what who's going to cover what who's going to get what kind of uh, scoop perhaps this time so the net result is that um, the public is underserved i think in terms of 
the information they get by this uh, kind of cartel. And um, there have been, uh, there's been more criticism of it in, with the advent of blogging and other mm-hmm. forms of, uh, you know, Twitter, that kind of thing. So um, I think that uh, it can't last forever. Uh, they're gradually chipping away at the Keisha Club system, but it still is a, a big uh, hindrance for people doing news today in Japan if they're not part of the, um, the, the Keisha Clubs themselves. Well, thank you for that overview. That that's a, I have a good overview. Uh, do you know of any other similar systems uh, outside of Japan? Maybe not uh, quite there as are draconian. Clubs, yeah, there are clubs that do exist outside of Japan um, that uh, can be restrictive, but maybe not as much. Japan stands out for for being quite exclusive with this system. For example, um, you know, in the U.S. government, they have you know briefings yes. that are given to certain reporters. And of course, even in other, in many countries, they have like a press credential system. You have to get credentials uh, to be able to attend certain, say, press conferences or public unveilings or openings of some whatever uh, facility. Mm-hmm. And so the, the Japan system didn't come out of nowhere, but um, it, it is quite restrictive compared to other countries. Right. Um- you sort of have touched on this uh, a little bit in one of your previous answers, but I was going to ask you about as a professional writer and particularly, excuse me, a freelance professional writer, um, what it has been or is continues to be the influence of media channels such as blogs, um, personal websites, social media, people who are not professional writers, but are putting out a lot of content. How has that changed the landscape for a freelance writer? especially here in Japan, where it's starting to boom, like, like more than much more than before. Absolutely. Um, it's both um, an advantage and a disadvantage, I would say. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, for example, uh, you, it's easy to have your own channel, your own platform now with uh, the web, YouTube, whatever you want. So if you like, you can just go and, and write anything you want to, and, and perhaps you can build up an audience, and uh, maybe you can break stories uh, eventually. That's wonderful. And maybe you can eventually generate your own income by doing that. Excuse me. Um, on the other hand, if you are just a traditional journalist, that's a lot more competition for you. Uh, possibly you may, you may get scooped. Um, by some of these upstarts, uh, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. Uh, But back to the other side of the coin, um, I did a story some years ago about uh, one of these uh, sort of startup organizations. Well, it wasn't a blogging uh, type of arrangement. It was more of a a formal uh, commitment to, um, uh, you know, free uh, press and uncovering stories that uh, the established uh, media in Japan did not want to uncover. And that's called Waseda Chronicle. Waseda mm-hmm. Chronicle was um, founded by a couple of people who came from establishment media in Japan. They were not satisfied with uh, the amount of, um, you know, restrictions they faced and, and in some cases self-censorship that was being imposed um, within the newsroom that they came from. So they decided, okay, we're going to leave those jobs and, uh, bye-bye to those salaries that we had. And we're going to start Waseda Chronicle, um, which is a kind of volunteer-led um, uh, organization website that's been um, doing stories. For example, one that I uh, remember involved, um, I believe, uh, kickbacks, uh, fraud involving prominent uh, media and uh, PR companies, ad companies in Japan. So, um, so that's one way that, um, you know, gaps in the establishment media are being filled or needs are being met by people using, you know, these relatively new technologies Mm -hmm. and, uh, and just, you know, ignoring the corporate power structures that existed in the past and going on their own and doing a great job. For Japanese media outlets, uh, Yomiuri Shimbun is just one example that comes to mind, who also produce an English language version sometimes even a daily English language version, or often a daily English language version. Do they generally work only with freelancers or do they have in-house staff? Uh, That's a good question. I think it's a mixture from Mm -hmm. what I can see. Um, 
So Japanese uh, news companies um, tend to try to straddle both worlds. In, in other words, uh, serving the domestic market, but also trying to serve uh, a foreign readership as well. Mm -hmm. And so Kyoto News, where yes. I used to work a long time ago, uh, is one example. So they have a, um, a very extensive nationwide network of bureaus. Mm -hmm. uh, Kyoto News is like a, a news agency. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's like Associated Press in the States or um, Canadian Press in Canada, uh, for example, mm -hmm. uh, AFP, in front, et cetera. So yes. I say they have a na nationwide network. And so they're generating tons of news in Japanese. And they're, they're quite good at doing breaking news. There's a big earthquake or other disaster some, somewhere. They're on that because they got a bureau not too far away. Um, that being said, they took or they do take part of their domestically generated output in Japanese and they translate some of that, like the important stories about the prime minister, etc. And they put it out in English and they have people editing that, which is what I did. And uh, in our little division of Kyoto, that's what, that's what our job was to do. Meanwhile, some of the other people in that part of Kyoto were generating original stories in English. And, and they let me write a couple of original features in English too. And so I would think that other, uh, you mentioned Yomiuri, uh, they probably do a mix of both. Like they translate some of their copy. Maybe mm -hmm. they have a couple of freelancers or in-house people who do original uh, stories in English, perhaps, or even Chinese is, is very important these days, too. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think it's a mix of, um, of uh, trying to uh, get that balance between domestic and foreign. Another thing I should mention is that there, a couple questions ago, you asked me what's different between the news here and overseas. Aside from the Kisha Club system, I would say that the expectations of the reader mm -hmm person who's consuming the news in, let's say, Canada compared to uh, Japan are, are different, totally different. That's why when I was working at Kyoto doing editing these stories, they would just be translated straight, like Japanese into English. And, and for the reader, they would be lacking in context of what does this mean to me? I don't know what this means. Or sometimes the lead you know, the most important part of the story would be buried in, you know, the last paragraph of the translation. So, mm -hmm. you know, we had to, you know, flip them and rewrite them, et cetera, et cetera. Try to, meanwhile, trying not to uh, antagonize the chief editor of that section because they didn't want it to go too far away from the Japanese original. And yet we wanted to make it more relevant and um, contextualized for overseas readers. So there was this continual sort of tug of war between the two Japanese and the English. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so if you if you read news in Japanese, the, the, it's it's abbreviated, the, much is understood without being said. Uh, for example, sources are often not named. Where does mm -hmm. this information come from? Oh, it, just, it doesn't say in Japanese. It just says like, it is understood that this, mm -hmm. this is happening. Mm -hmm. So the standards are different. And so people, working in that sort of cross-cultural cross -cultural milieu. Translators also, you know, people who are translating, so let's say, novels from Japanese into English, they also have to play with the differences uh, in what is expected in a reader's mind in Japanese versus an overseas reader's mind. Sure. Could you also maybe explain what is and what does the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan do, the FCCJ? I think you are a member of that, if I check the list correctly. Yeah, I am a member of the mm. uh, FCCJ. And uh, basically, it's a, uh, a club for... Uh, originally, it was founded in, at the end of World War II, 1945, when uh, the American occupation began, the, the Allied occupation began of Japan. Mm. And, uh, you know, dozens and dozens of foreign reporters were streaming into the country to to see what was going on here in this devastated, bombed out uh, capital, Tokyo. And they formed this organization called Foreign Correspondents of Japan. So it's a, it's a press club. What is a press club? This is different from a Kisha club. A mm -hmm. press club here is kind of a social organization, like a salon, perhaps, mm -hmm. which also uh, hosts news events, like press conferences. Okay. Um, the one big problem, though, is that uh, 
after Japan entered um, its um, stagnant period after the collapse of the bubble economy, it became less of an interesting news story for overseas news organizations. They started looking at China much more. They started sending correspondents to China much more. And um, the problem is that the number of journalists at the FCCJ started declining. So they had to bring in a lot more non-journalists, people who are just business people or somehow interested in media or people who thought that uh, being a member of the FCCJ was something um, prestigious and, and, uh, and interesting. So they did that. So now there are many more non-journalists than journalists at the club. However, really? uh, the FCCJ still does host um, uh, press events like press conferences. Mm -hmm. And the good thing about those events is that you often get to hear uh, the voices of people who are, you would say, perhaps underrepresented or ignored in Japan. Mm -hmm. And um, often they'll host a, um, a series of, of press conferences, for example, getting two sides of the story. Like recently there was um, uh, an issue, a scandal in, I think it was Gunma Prefecture, if I'm not mistaken, in which um, a member of the prefectural assembly, a woman said she'd been uh, uh, sexually molested uh, by um, another member uh, and uh, so the FCJ decided to um, hold uh, one conference by her and another conference by the accused party. And, uh, and you know, you get both sides of, of the situation uh, that the FCCJ, to its credit, is one of the only forums in Japan in which you can have this kind of um, both sides of the story. Is what I'm trying to say. Uh, so, so that's a great merit, and they, you know, they stream these uh, press events, and um, it's a it's a great way to gain more insight into, say, for example, if you're interested in, in the, you know, the latest um, uh, political developments, economic developments, that kind of thing. Um, that being said, the FCCJ is not uh, what it used to be, <laughs> but mm -hmm. uh, it's carrying on, and um, if you're interested in media and uh current events in japan i i would say you should check it out thanks for tuning in for more insights on japan from people who know japan be sure to subscribe to the ronjiru japan youtube channel right now just click the subscribe button below this video and the notification bell so you'll always know when we post something new from ronjiru japan in tokyo i've been jt see you in the next video everyone